Scripture reading for today is going to come from Judges chapter 8, starting in verse 22. Give you a moment to flip there. The stories that we're covering today, if you're doing study at home on your own, and you want to read this, which I strongly encourage everyone, please do so. Judges is a really challenging book when you read it carefully. Uh, But today's story is covering chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9. Gideon has a lot of stuff happening in his life in the in the Bible, and we're going to be not every verse, but we're going to cover his story and his son's story, which takes place in chapter nine. So Judges chapter eight, starting in verse twenty-two. This takes place just uh, as a brief recap. This will take place at the end of Gideon's story, but I think it's a great capstone on what I want to talk about, and as a way to kind of finalize Gideon's story to start with that premise. So chapter 8, starting in verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. And they answered, We will be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on the camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Oprah, his town, All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Thus, Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise his head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace 40 years. Jeroboam, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, who he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at, the, at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash and Oprah of the Abezerites. No sooner had Gideon died than Israel began again prostituted themselves to Baals. They set up Baal Bereth as their god and did not remember the Lord their god who had rescued him from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. This is the word of the Lord. There is a phrase that I have been chewing on, thinking about deeply for the past week, and that is to take pride in your work. Now, in modern times, this is largely a positive thing. Basically meaning, if you don't know, we want to do our work in such a way that when we look on it later, we don't feel any shamed, we don't feel embarrassed, we don't feel like, ugh, I didn't even try. This is a phrase meant to capture the idea that we want to work hard, to put our best foot forward, to make sure that when we work, we work to the best of our ability and we don't give up or pretend or not even really try. But I've been thinking about that phrase a lot. Because pride, scripturally speaking, is always bad. It's never a good thing. And so I've been trying to chew on what to do with it. Do we change the phrase? Do I recommend a new one? And I don't think I will. Because I think we largely understand when we say take pride in our work that we know that we're not becoming arrogant. We're not becoming prideful in the sinful sense. But again, trying to capture that idea of working to our best ability the first time. And as I read the Gideon story, what I noticed is that what starts off as a timid, scared young man turns into a man who accomplishes many great things for Israel and ends up tripping on his own pride. If I had a sentence I wanted to give you, it's that taking too much pride in your work can be a detriment to our call as Christians. Taking too much pride in your work is a detriment to our call as Christians. To explain this, I want to go over Gideon's story, his life, and then Abimelech's life, his son, briefly, before we talk about pride and and really discuss it. 
So who is Gideon? Gideon is the next prophet. This begins, of the last three major prophets we're going to cover, this begins the first prophet who's, he's all right. The first three prophets we covered were great. Deborah was good. Uh, Othniel was good. Ehud, they were all great. There were no comments. There were no sin issues present in their lives that the Bible recorded. So we're left to assume they did a good job. Israel was led to prosperous times during their leadership. They did not sin. But, as per the usual, they didn't last. And we open in chapter 6, so Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. For 70 years he gave them into the hand, for seven years, I apologize, he gave them into the hand of the Midianites, because the power of the Midianites was so oppressive that Israel prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. As a pause, Arian and I, when we traveled to Israel, experienced one of these tunnels. We went into a house and went to their basement, and there was a little hole, like this big. It was just enough for me to go through and then pull my backpack through behind me. I couldn't wear it through the tunnel. But we walked through there, and they had little, like, clefts in the rock where they would store food or different things like that, tunnels that would connect to another house. We walked underground, maybe like 30 or 40 feet through these tunnels. These were The tunnels we went through were built around the time of Rome, we believe, but it's the idea that what they built into the caves and in the mountains were hot tunnels and holes that they could hide in. So they couldn't be found. They couldn't be oppressed. <clears throat> Verse 3, Whenever Israel, Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. Neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. Scott, if you could put that map on the screen. So it's up there. Some of you have this. Um, Gideon is located in Manasseh, the big yellow strip near the top, probably to the left of the Jordan River. Uh, we don't know where Oprah is. That's where Gideon's from. We'll get there in just a minute. But what we just read is that the Midianites, from where they came, oppressed them all the way down to the land of the Philistines, all the way down to the town of Gaza. They took a huge chunk of land. So you have to assume at least as far north as Manasseh, which is just south of the Sea of Galilee, south and it goes through Ephraim, Dan, Benjamin, Judah, Simeon. All of this is oppressed. All of their crops are destroyed. They are being uh, ruined and harmed by the Midianites. And Scott, you can leave that map up <clears throat> for now. So in verse 7, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, and this is a first, he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live but you have not listened to me. This setup is a lot more intense than the last few. This time, rather than just hearing their cries and sending them a judge, this time he sends them a prophet, not to give them words of hope, but to condemn them. You are suffering because you did not listen to me. Let me remind you of who I am, the God who brought your ancestors out of Egypt, who rescued you from slavery, who brought you through into this land, who gave it to you, uh, to, and helped you conquer it. And all I said was, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship other gods. And yet, every single time, that's what happens. Now, we're going to introduce Gideon. I'm not going to read all this. But to summarize, Gideon is just a young man. And he is threshing wheat in a place that he has to do it privately. Now, normally when you thresh wheat, you do it on a hilltop. And what you do is you would take a piece of wood and you put like sharp stones, glass, maybe metal, and you embed it into that wood and you would throw the grain heads onto just a little stake. And an ox or sometimes a person, depending, would just pull that sledge in a circle. And as you throw the grains, those sharp rocks would then knock the kernels off and you would just take a pitchfork and throw up the chaff, and it would blow away. 
So if you think of that verse, uh, Psalm 1 that we read as responsive reading, which says they're like chaff blown away in the wind, that's the image. You take the grain in the chaff, you just scoop it up and throw it into the air, and the wind would just catch it and fly it away. Gideon is doing this somewhere where that can't be seen, which sounds like a nightmare, trying to separate the grain from the chaff. But he has to do it in secret, as we just read, because the Midianites would come and either ruin or take the food. And this is where we meet an angel who comes to Gideon and says, Hey, listen, Gideon, I have a job for you. Now, this is one of a few times where Gideon, in order to trust that he's actually talking to an angel of God or actually hearing from God, he's going to say, God, will you let me put a test out to prove that it's you? And the first one is just let me bring you an offering. So he runs off, grabs an offering, comes back. It's consumed by fire. And so Gideon says, okay, you're the one. And this first story is really important. So God calls Gideon to save Israel. And the first task is he wants you to go and destroy the Baals and the Asherah poles and ruin them, to destroy them completely. So Gideon does. However, he does so under the cover of night because he's scared and does not want to be caught. Because at this time, Israel is still even though they're being oppressed, worshiping other gods. Baal would be a catch-all for a general god. Asherah is a god of, or goddess of fertility. And these altars were set up so that you could worship these two. It's ironic. God, the creator God, is not being worshipped. Instead, they are worshipping Baal and Asherah instead of just God. If nothing else, this is an efficiency problem. Why worship two gods when you can worship one, right? <clears throat> but Gideon tears down these altars, and using their remains, he constructs an altar to the Lord and sets an offering on it. Eventually, the people find out what he did, and they confront him about it. And this is where he gets the nickname that I read to you earlier in Judges chapter 8 where he's called Jerub Baal, meaning the one who destroyed Baal's altar. And he's given that name a few times throughout his story. Now, God then calls Gideon to lead the Israelites to a Midianite camp to destroy it. And this is the second time where Gideon sets out two tests. First, he takes a, a fur pelt and lays it on the ground and says, God, if you really are with me, and you're going to help me make it so that the pelt is wet and the ground around it is dry from the dew. So he goes out, goes to sleep, and God does this. He's able to wring out water from the pelt. But because Gideon is scared and he's nervous, he really wants to know, God, are you really with me? He said, God, please don't be angry. One more, please do the opposite. Make it so that the ground is wet and the pelt is dry. And so God does it. And Gideon then says, okay, God, you're with me. And he sets out to some very strange ways of eliminating who is going to go with him. He takes 10,000 people and cuts it down to 300. Because God wants him to know that it was him, the Lord, who won this victory. Not Gideon. So Gideon does all this. He goes to the camp where they bang loud drums and they uh, make a lot of noise. It causes confusion in the camp. God sends confusion to that camp, causing everyone to then kill themselves. The kings of Gideon flee, and Gideon pursues them north through uh, that red space, Issachar and Zebulun. Eventually, he's able to catch up with them. And once he does... This is another interesting thing about his character. He orders his son, his oldest son, to kill the kings of Gideon. Zuba, uh, Zeba, uh, this is verse 21 of chapter 8. Zeba and Zalmunna are the kings of Midian. And Gideon out orders his son, says, Jether, kill them. But he wouldn't do it. His son was scared. The Bible describes him as only a young boy. And so the kings mock Gideon. says, come on, do it yourself. If you're so much of a brave man, if you're really that strong, do it yourself. And so Gideon does, steps forward and kills them and loots them. Now, this is where we get to the scripture that we read. Now, everything I've read up to this point seems to be relatively on par. 
There's one brief story that I skipped over where Gideon goes to two different towns and asks for help in pursuing the enemy, and they both refuse to help him. They're like, look, what's the big deal? He's already on the run. Like, why should we bother to help you? We don't have enough supplies. We're not going to help you. And Gideon will later come back and destroy and punish those towns for not helping him defeat these enemy kings of Midian. But what's going on with Gideon's ephod? Well, an ephod is a priestly vestment. It's part of the garb that Moses was given orders from God to build for the priests. And they would wear this in addition to a breastplate and other things, and it was meant to signify their role. This ephod is made of gold, and the ironic thing is Gideon takes this and sets this up back in his hometown after it's made. And the Bible tells us, all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Now, whenever the Bible pauses to illustrate the sin, pay attention to what's going on. Israel prostituting themselves is a, it's metaphorical. And what it means is that Israel is worshiping another God besides the Lord. In terms of idolatry, terms of unfaithfulness or prostitution are often used when God is describing the faithlessness of Israel to him. It is not just idolatry, it's adultery. It's cheating. It is betrayal. It is breaking a covenant promise made between two parties. Much like a marriage adultery would be the same thing. As for it becoming a snare for Gideon and his family, we're not 100% sure what that means. I believe this means that Gideon and his family likely became too proud of the work that they did. In watching Israel worship this ephod that they set up like it's an altar and giving praise to both him and God, I think it inflated Gideon's sense of ego. And although, as we read earlier, Gideon turns down their request to be a king, he doesn't seem to turn down the results of being a king. We find out that he had 70 sons. Now, it's listing just sons. It probably means he also had daughters. He had a lot of kids. So Gideon, although he isn't king, certainly is living just like one. And of all of these sons, there's one in particular that's highlighted, a a second or third wife, some alternate wife that he happens to have that he had a kid with. His name is Abimelech. And in Hebrew, that means my father is the king. Now, we're not 100% sure if it's Gideon or uh, Abimelech, who changes his name later to Abimelech, but we know that Abimelech is a unique name here, and he's going to play an important role in his life. But Gideon lives like a king. And now the Bible concludes that no sooner did Gideon die than Israel again prostituted themselves back to the very gods that he tore down. And they also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jeroboam, Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. What does that mean? Well, Abimelech decides, actually, I do want to be king. I do want to lead. In fact, to make sure that my leadership is secure, I am going to ask that all of the Israelites get together and kill all of the other sons. All 70 or 69 of them. And so they do it. In fact, specifically, it's the people of Shechem who gather together and kill all of Gideon's sons, except for one who is able to get away. Abimelech then goes on a bit of a tirade. One son was able to escape. Of the 69 they tried to kill, one was able to escape. And God used him as a prophet to tell a parable before he runs off. And for three years, Abimelech rules Israel until the people begin to get sick and tired of Abimelech. And he can't stand that. So he begins to kill anyone who opposes him. Until finally... In attempting to destroy a tower, it's, uh, the Bible tells us that a woman throws a millstone down and hits Abimelech in the head. And before he dies, he requests his sword bearer kill him instead. 
Because how dare he die with the shame that he was killed by a woman? Listen, Abimelech is he's scum. He's not a good guy. And he chose to be killed effectively through assisted suicide rather than die because he was hurting and harming innocent people. Well, innocent. Israel's not really innocent in this story. These are the stories of Gideon and Abimelech. Now, Gideon is largely okay. He lives his life and is honest with God and pursues the calls that God gave him. However, there are a couple of passages. The, the call with the, the, the taunting by the kings in Judges 8.21 seems to indicate that Gideon developed a strong sense of pride and arrogance towards his own accomplishments and sense of honor. And when they questioned it and said, listen, if, you're, if you yourself are so strong, do it yourself, it seems to have triggered something or struck something in him that caused him to need to respond accordingly. And Gideon's ephod, setting that up and building it, even though he requested kindly to have these earrings brought over to him, he set up an altar that is, in essence, a testament to the work that he did. And Abimelech is simply riding his father's coattails in honor and glory. So what is pride, and why should we be concerned about it? Pride is simply, scripturally speaking, when we take our eyes off of God, the one who has given us the things and abilities, and instead we start to look at ourselves. This would be like a preacher who says that I am a good preacher and gives no credit or glory to God for that fact. And there's a fine line, right? Someone who can say, listen, I am good with my hands and I can repair my cars or build a hutch and do a good job. There's nothing wrong with saying that. The problem is we must always give glory to God because it is Him, it is Him alone who gave us the ability to do the things that we can do. Whether it's our desires and our drives, whether it's our physical ability or our knowledge or the experiences that we were led through, these come from God and God alone. And Gideon, and all of the judges for that matter, are no different. You see, the Spirit of the Lord is always described to come on these judges to ensure their victory. And so God enabled Gideon to lead. It was God who threw the Midianite camp into chaos, and it was God who brought the Midianite kings into Gideon's hands. God is the one alone who made Gideon successful. And yet, in all of this story of Gideon, we never really see Gideon honor God. In fact, at one point, the people are honoring both God and Gideon. Glory to God and glory to Gideon for the work that he has done. Pride, when we take our eyes off God and we look to ourselves as the author of our abilities and our accomplishments, is a problem. Which is why I was struggling with the phrase, take pride in your work, because there are a different way to say that. Ultimately, I don't think that there is. I think if we take pride in our work, and we're not taking too much pride in our work, I think there should always be, and we should check ourselves, an understanding of gratitude towards God. God, I am proud of the fact that my son is healthy and is running around as being silly. I thank you that you have given me the ability to raise him and he has the personality that he does. Some of you have done physical labor and have heard some of the things that you've built or constructed. And there's nothing wrong with taking pride in that work. As long as you acknowledge that it was God who blessed you. All Gideon had to do was not build that altar with the ephod. And instead say, listen, I will lead you in the sense of being a judge, but I am not going to be your king. Your job, God is king, and your job is to worship him alone. But Gideon never said that. He just said, listen, the Lord will rule over you. Also, can I have a bunch of gold earrings? I want to make a statue. When we take too much pride in our work, we take our eyes off of ourselves, and we focus on what we have accomplished through our own hands. And we become incensed, or angry when someone questions that work. If someone thinks we suddenly didn't do a good job on the house that we built or the car that we repaired or the kids that we raised, and they say, listen, your kids are kind of snots and they're really rude and mean and disrespectful in public. 
If we take too much pride in our work, our response might be anger. Rather, we should always take the response that God calls us to have, which is humility. Remember, Paul, in Ephesians, after he walked through what our call is, which is children of God, people of God, blessed and saved by God, he begins verse 4 by saying, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Everything we do, every moment in our life should be dedicated to glorifying God, even the private moments that no one knows about. Even the things that we have done that no one will ever find out about. We should do them to the best of our ability, taking pride in our work because we want to glorify God. That's our goal. We take pride. We want to do the best we can the first time. We want to put our best effort into our work, to our call, to our job, to our spouses, our families, whatever. Because we want to honor and glorify the Father who has given us everything we could ever ask for or imagine. That's our call. And that was only ever the call of Israel. All they ever had to do was give God his due to worship him alone, and to give him credit for all of the times that he showed up and saved them from themselves. And so now, when we do something, whether it's for God, whether it's in this church, whether it's uh, something that we've done in our past, if we look back and say, I'm glad I did that, and I take a small amount of pride in it, make sure that there is a small amount of, or a large amount of gratitude that follows that pride, that honors the God who made it possible. When I think back of my time as a youth pastor, there is a lot I can be proud of. A lot of relationships that I built and a lot of kids' lives that I touched. But it was not just my own effort. In fact, it was barely my own effort. The effort that I put in was the effort to be faithful to the call that God gave me. Instead, I want to honor and glorify God because he made that possible. It was not me. All I did was faithfully respond to his call. God is the one who enabled my abilities and my skills. And while I did a good job, it was because of what God has done. Many of you can say a similar thing. I want to end with an illustration on pride. I'm going to read to you. Two brothers went away to college. One brother became a farmer... The other became a brilliant, wealthy lawyer. The lawyer brother visited the farmer brother on the farm. He said, I can't believe you've not made anything of your life. You're out here on a farm. Look at me. Look at where I'm at. I'm on Wall Street. I'm an investor in the stock market. I have clients who are millionaires. Here you are, stuck out here on the farm. I wonder what the difference is between us. The farmer brother then spoke. He pointed out to his wheat field, and he said, Do you see? You'll see two types of wheat out there, brother. You'll see wheat that stands straight up. In the head of the wheat, there is nothing. It's empty. That's why it's standing so high. You'll also see some other wheat that's bent over. That's because the head is full. It's full of wheat. See, some of us are standing straight up. We're walking tall. However, we are only able to do so because we are empty. Some of us are a little bent over, indicating that we are full. The test isn't what you have in your pocket. It's what you have in your heart. The image there, I think, is a good one. To stand tall is taking too much pride in our work. Our eyes are fixed upwards, almost in defiance. We're saying, look at me and look what I've accomplished. But if we're bent over then we are bowing to the king who has made all of the things that we have done possible. So remember, be faithful to the calls that God has given us because that's our job. You can take pride in your work as long as you take a generous amount of gratitude and humility afterwards, knowing that it was God who did it, God who accomplished it. And it was God alone who will continue to make those kinds of things happen whether or not we want to help him.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that you, you love us in spite of our failures and our weaknesses. You love us when we do take too much pride in our work and when we have our humility where it's supposed to be. We're thankful that you never give up on us. You've never abandoned us. You've never failed us. You are faithful and kind and good. Lord, I pray that humility and gratitude would fill our hearts today. That we would not become so proud and arrogant that we would take our eyes off of you and put them on ourselves instead. Father, may we always remember the work that you have done in our lives, the gifts that you have given us. And may we always say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for our abilities. Thank you for the opportunities to serve you. Father, as we close this time and we move towards communion, I pray that as we take communion, we would have that single echo in our heart. Thank you, Jesus. You died for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose again. Thank you, Jesus. The sins that I confess are not sins that burden me any longer. Father, lighten our load, encourage our hearts, and help us to have gratitude. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.